Welcome to Equilibrium Live with me, your host, Sarah Tabo. And as you know, each week we're tackling different topics around music business and music ministry and finding the balance between the two. We're in episode six today and we're going to be talking about music marketing myths tips and tricks and today I'm joined by some exceptionally beautiful ladies and a guy who's going to be joining us shortly and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a bit more detail but I'm just going to say who they are. I've got from the US Angela Moss Paul. She's a wonderful singer-songwriter and she's got so much to say about music marketing particularly from an independent artist perspective. I can't wait to hear what all the juice and all the knowledge that she has to bring to today's um, session and discussion. We also have Cassandra, beautiful lovely lady I only got to meet and know her very recently but I watch her all the time on socials <laughs> she does get up to some interesting stuff on social media she's a content creator and a radio presenter with Premier Gospel in the UK and as I said there's a lot of juice and knowledge coming from her as well today we will be having join us in about 45 minutes or so Derek Chi who is the founder of Gospel Hydration he's just running behind but he's le he's looking forward to and very keen to join the conversation today so thank you all for joining from YouTube and Facebook you've probably been following this entire conversation for the last six or seven weeks and you know the drill share this link Tell a friend to tell a friend, we're going live. We are live talking about music business, talking about music marketing, myths, tips, and tricks. Get your pen and paper, get your juice and coffee, and let's get knowledgeable together. So without further ado, welcome, Angela, and welcome, Cassandra. And um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks yourselves. For <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves to the ladies and gentlemen watching. But in addition to that, I always like to have a kind of icebreaker and um, so people can get to know a bit more about you and today's icebreaker is um and I've checked this with you guys beforehand so I know that you've watched the sitcom Friends I don't know anyone who hasn't watched Friends um so I want to know from you who is your favorite character from Friends and why and then obviously introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about yourself so I'll probably start with Angela okay well again I'm Angela Moss Poole my favorite character from Friends is Rachel and I just feel like Rachel was that person that everyone, especially when the show was new and fresh, everybody wanted to be like Rachel. They wanted Rachel's haircut and Rachel's oh, yeah. style. And she was oh, yeah. just that girl, you know, even now with the reruns, you know, that she, that's still the character. And so I always love to watch the show. She was always kind of like insecure, but kind of confident, but still insecure. So I like to relate yeah. to her that way. Um, yeah, I'm a singer yeah. songwriter. <laughs> And my husband and I um, have our own uh, independent label, 141st Lane Music. That's the street that I grew up on in Miami, Florida. And uh, we work with independent artists to help them to understand how they can operate as an independent label. So we focus on songwriting, we write for film and TV, and manage a catalog for sync. So very happy to be on your show today. That's really exciting. Lovely to have you. And, and interesting to know that Rachel's your favorite character. As you say, I think she's most people's uh, favorite character. Brilliant. Um, Cassandra. Hello. Um, I do have friends on in the background, so this was a heavy question. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite character is Rachel, yes, but for different reasons. I think she's oh. really petty. Um, and I love the little witty one-liners that she comes out with sometimes. And Chandler, because he is really funny. Oh, yeah. Um, He's and hopeless, I, honestly. Yeah, and he's he, he has a way of just breaking up, you know, moments with little lines that I really like. So they're my yeah. Um, I think yeah, and 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 yeah. Carry on, sorry. So introduce yourself, sorry. No, no. What were you gonna say? No, no, no. I don't worry. I don't want to take anything from you just now. When you finish, I was gonna talk about my character, but I forgot you had to introduce yourself. So go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I am Cassandra. Hi, um, I'm a comedian. I have. Uh, done all types of comedy, stand-up, sketches online, which is my main speciality. Um, I've just started a comedy writing course, so I'm gonna be getting into that. I'm also a radio presenter. I present 11 shows a week on Premier Gospel. Got a nice week off this week, so you know, that's why I'm chilling here. Um, and I'm a shows. content creator, wow. yeah. Um, but I'm also a content creator, so I create, like I said, sketches for Instagram, um, YouTube, and, I'm starting to get into TikTok because I've been told that that is a place 
to upload things. <laughs> you know, that is something I had on the agenda today. I'm glad you mentioned it because I think, yeah, I'm having to do the same. So I'm going to be taking notes from you, tips from you on how to go about it. No, but yeah, you just have to be futuristic and think about the next best thing. Um, but no, that's brilliant. And as I said earlier, I'm really looking forward to getting some really exciting and in insightful nuggets from you on more so the creative side of marketing, which is one of the reasons why we have you on the panel. Um, a bit of a sidetrack. So in terms of my favorite um, friend's character, that would have to be Phoebe. I just love how she's eclectic and eccentric and just overall a crazy lady, basically. <laughs> And she's kind of like the life of the party in a weird kind of way. It's like when all the friends are together and she's not there, something feels like it's missing. It just feels like you need that element of insanity. And Phoebe is that person yeah, Phoebe <laughs> who brings it. So. Yeah, she's a great character. I do love Phoebe. Yeah, she is. She's, she's really weird. She's really, really weird. But anyway, so hey, AJG and whoever else is watching, thanks for joining. If you're watching on YouTube and Facebook, please share the link and obviously comment, ask questions. Actually, most of the episodes that we've had, we've been seeing lots of questions. So if you're an artist or a creative and you have questions for any of our guests, you can start putting them in now. Questions to do with music marketing or even just promotion, all of those exciting things that come with being a creative, put them in the comments and we'll be taking your questions. So share, share, talk, talk, comment, comment, engage, engage. Right. So to dive straight into the topic, then when it comes to music marketing, which is something I'm very passionate about. Um, when I started, actually, um, as an independent artist, I'm naturally an introvert and I feel like most creatives are naturally I could be wrong. But I feel like most of us just want to get on with writing music, get on with creating music and then just let things take their natural course, like make a hit somehow. And um, so I was not one to be on social media. Right. I was not one to even make noise about what I do. Naturally, I just want to sing, go back to my seat. If they clap, they clap, you know. Um, and equally, I think that's something that's um, steeped in the fact that we're Christians. And so we're probably just looking to be a blessing you know praise the lord and then you know just do our thing and do our calling and and i was one of those people who just wanted to be a blessing i just wanted to you know minister put music out there and and just but then when i started to create music to put it out there as a commercial product which is something that we don't like to call you know, gospel music or spiritual music, a product. I had to come to terms with the fact that I have produced and created a product and therefore I had to market the product. And I struggled to come to terms with the whole concept of marketing. And I feel like um, people are probably in that state where I was right now. They're probably looking and going, I don't want to be making noise on the mountaintops. I don't want to be bragging about what I'm doing. I don't want to call this business. Because when you talk marketing, you're talking promotion, you're talking campaigns, it's going to be on, ultimately you're talking business. And you're like, well, I don't, I just want to do ministry. And to be honest, that's partly why I'm, I tend to have these discussions is to see how we can balance ministry and business. Because ultimately we're not in it for money, but we have to be faithful stewards to the gift and the, you know, the, the talent, if you like, that God has gifted us. So to bring it to bring it home then i'll probably ask angela because you've worked or you you still do work with creatives and independent artists and helping them look at themselves at, as not just creatives or artists but as labels i had to you know swallow the pill of okay i am also my marketing manager i'm also my promoter i'm also gonna go and say hey i've got a song go listen to it and it was hard i have to say I know people look at me now and they go like, oh, you do this in your sleep, but it was really, really hard. So I'll probably start by asking Angela, how have you found, I mean, before you got to where you are now, did you have similar kind of observations as a creative? Did you maybe struggle with coming to terms with the importance of music marketing or even music business when considered or compared against a music ministry? I did. Uh, you know, like you were saying, Sarah, it's that humility, right? Oh, well, I just want to be a blessing and I just want to bless the people with the music. And, and I, you know, I went through that too. But like you said, when you start to invest money in producing the music and the cost of recording the music and making a commercial product, 
you realize it's something that you have to sell because the one it's, it is a business. You have to recoup your money back for the cost and you want people to buy your product. And so mm-hmm. I really did struggle with that. So I would give away free download cards and I was afraid to really put a price on it. And I would say, well, just give a love offering, whatever you feel it's worth. And then later I was just like, what am I doing? This is the price. This is, you know, this is what it costs. I have to charge this and I have to let mm-hmm. people know it's for sale. I have to let them know you can download it on Spotify. You can download it on Apple Music or Gospel Boom Play or wherever it is because people have to know where to find you. And that even mm-hmm. is part of your ministry. I started to think about other types of ministers who charge for their product. You have people like T.D. Jakes, you know, and great authors who they have conferences and you have to register for these conferences sometimes and pay. Mm -hmm, Or they have mm -hmm, books mm -hmm. and they have no problem telling you about their product table or their books for sale, right? And we don't look at at them as how dare they sell this book, you know? And it's the same way for us as artists. We should look at it as God has given us something to share, but it it has a cost because it costs us something to produce it and we would Mm -hmm. like them to enjoy it. And we're you know, mm-hmm. charging something fair. And there's a saying, mm-hmm. I don't know if they say this in the UK, but in the US, there's a saying of if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Hmm. Right. And so we have this whole thing of if we don't make a sound, if we don't make sure someone hears, hears that it's out there, then did your product make a sound? Did your sound, did your song get out did it bless the people Mm. they don't even know Mm, it mm, exists mm. right so it's Mm, part mm, of mm. the ministry of letting people know this song can bless you just like td jake says my book will bless you if you buy this book yeah so believe in your music believe in what god is giving you and let the people know i believe this will be a blessing to you and here's where you can you can find it here's where you can Mm. purchase it Mm mm-hmm Absolutely. I don't know if you want to weigh into that, Cassandra, before I move on to to the next point, maybe from many observations that you've made. Yeah, just from an observation of I don't do music, but it is similar with other creative fields. For example, I do, you know, online videos and videos for this and videos for that. But I think the whole thing about I'm not doing it for money, I think that's where we get caught up. Um, Whether it is a religious thing or whether it's, I think, in the UK, we have this thing of we want to be humble and, you know, modest and there's all of that. But the way that I've always mm-hmm. seen it is that if you have a gift, you're allowed to make a living off of that gift. There are people that yeah. have a gift to, I don't know, be a waitress. I've never had that gift. I'm really clumsy. It's not <laughs> my fault. You're so right. But I don't think they're I They're going to go and make money off of being a waitress. And it's when it comes to creative things, I think we have to maybe take it off of that... Uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's like we put it up here and it's like, well, we can't make money because it's a gift, but you can, because if that's what you want to make your livelihood off of, Mm -hmm. that's it. If God's giving you a gift and that's how you're going to make your bread and butter, that's Mm -hmm. kind of, um, and so I think we just have to get rid of that fear of charging for things. I, when I first started to host shows, I didn't charge people because I was like, I can't charge people for that because it's a gift. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But after a while, Mm -hmm. I was like, actually, no. I'm actually taking hours of my day to exactly. prepare to the show, to host the show, to the stay afterwards. That's like a good five hours that I'm giving mm-hmm. over to somebody else. And as much mm-hmm. as it is, it's a great thing to do and I love it and God may have given me a gift. It's still something that if you really want to make it your livelihood, that's allowed because we are yeah. supposed to have a livelihood as children mm-hmm. of God and we should never mm-hmm. be scared to pursue that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I come from that. Absolutely. And the thing is, I, I kind of tagged today's um, episode, music marketing myths, tips and tricks. And I wanted to start by taking that myth of, oh, because I'm a Christian artist or I'm a gospel artist, I shouldn't be, one, charging for what I do, or two, even pushing aggressively, you know, to make a profit or even to make my, at least cover my cost. That myth, we have to demystify that because God doesn't expect us to come to, to be gifted and then to bury the gift and then come back to him with the exact same thing. Even the parable of the talents shows us very clearly that there is an expectation that when he gives you the talents, he actually used the word talents as a matter of fact, not, not the parable of money, but the parable of talents, even mm-hmm. though it was money bear, bearing in mind, but he's given them these talents and he expects them to multiply these talents. And I can guarantee you that the one who had multiplied it by 10, uh, by five times, didn't just sit on his hands. 
he would have sat down, he would have strategized, he would have thought about where he can go to multiply that, to, tr to, to quadruple it even, to make sure that his master had more than what he gave him at the start. So probably starting tonight by, you know, addressing the myth that because we're in a certain space, which is we're doing Christian music, religious music, we shouldn't aim to, you know, break even and actually make profits, or we shouldn't aim to be aggressive with our marketing. Can we just put that to one side? Because <laughs> that is not how we're going to actually um, make, make, make a headway. Also, one thing that should really drive us, I believe, is the fact that we know we have a more powerful, more life impacting, more life changing message. And that should really make us even more passionate to want to get more people to hear this message, right? People who have music that they've got no, that has no substance are more aggressive about their marketing than we who have a powerful transformative message. So even that in itself should give us um, a kind of clue to how more, how, yeah, active and aggressive we should be about our marketing. But anyway, so moving on to the next um, kind of, very much linked to what we've just talked about now, which is about, you know, being aggressive and just pushing through. Most of the people who watch and who DM me questions in advance of these episodes um, are relatively new, you know, to being recording artists or being gospel artists. I have some people who watch who are very established, but a lot of the guys who message me and who've been following this series are quite new to um, marketing, to, to being a, a creative or a gospel artist and likewise to music marketing. Now I have a, um, a music mentoring thing that I do. So I talk my mentees through different types of marketing that they need to have as fundamentals. But I'd like to get your views, um, particularly starting with Angela and then on to Cassandra. What you think are like the main aspects of marketing that an artist needs to have? You know, we could go on for hours, but I think the main ones that you just have to have as a creative, starting with obviously a good product, because you need to have, you're not marketing mediocre stuff. You have to start with a viable you know, high top quality uh, products. But moving on from the fact that we've got a good product, so let's underpin that by it's a good product we're marketing here. Then what are the next things that the most important fundamental aspects of a marketing strategy that creatives need to have? What I had to learn is defining my audience because I had to learn that my music was not for everyone, right? And so mm. although I wish and hoped everyone would love it. There's going to be a group of people that kind of are my people that like what I bring. And I worry about the ones that just aren't into my style of music or whatever, you know, my music mm. sounds like. So once you identify your customer, then you can kind of target your marketing to them. So if they're mm. more, um, maybe want to be engaging, maybe they like you to go live on social media versus maybe they like more, CDs versus uh, downloads and streaming because my audience, you know, maybe is a certain age group that they're not into streaming. Maybe they still like to buy a, a physical CD, right? So understanding mm -hmm. your audience, uh, maybe it's a younger audience and, and they don't, um, you know, they like for you to engage with them late at night, you know, on social <laughs> media. So understanding your, your customers mm -hmm. and your audience and reaching them where they are. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that, because I'm sure you're going to be t telling us a bit more. But to add to that, in order to understand, in order to identify and, and understand your audience, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, Angela, one of the things that you need to do, if you're an artist, and you've, if you've started putting out music onto Spotify, make sure that you have the Spotify mm -hmm. for Artists app. In there, you can actually identify and analyze the demographics of the people who listen to your music by age, by gender, by location. And those are kind of like the fundamental, you know, demographics that you need to identify because you could make a whole host of, of um, deductions off the back of those three things. If you know that most of your, your followers, for example, or your listeners are in a particular African country, say, for example, South Africa, mm -hmm. then you can actually look at all the songs that you've done and make a deduction as to which one you think kind of appeals more to people from that aspect, from that uh, part of the world. And that could even inform your next releases or could inform a particular release that you do dedicated to those, um, to that demographic or that subset of your demographic. Likewise, as you said, Angela, age group. So if all the people who listen to your music are below 18, good luck selling music because they're all going to, all they're going to do is stream. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All you're ever going to get is streaming right. numbers. But and then make it your means... song shorter. They don't want long music. 
two and a half minutes, you know, but then it means exactly, it informs how you create right. the next piece. It also informs how you market in the sense that these people are on TikTok and I'm going to come to you on that one, Cassandra. These people are on social media. These mm -hmm. younger consumers of music are in a specific bubble on, on, well, not bubble, in a specific space, you know, on the internet and you want to be able to be there with your followers. So I think it, to kind of add to Angela's point, you need to analyze your data in the likes of um, Spotify for artists, particularly Spotify for artists. And also you could use Apple for artists as well. You could do, but I think Spotify has got more analysis. Likewise, if you use Google ads for your YouTube videos, which I'm going to talk ab about later on, you can also analyze your demographics in there. Instagram is a good one as well. If you have an Instagram account where you've, I've never had a profile where I'm not like an artist. So I don't know if in an ordinary profile you can do, but in an artist profile, you definitely are like a business profile. You can analyze your demographics, what age groups, what countries, what cities even. Um, but the other thing is, if you haven't got any of these, because I always like to think of the person who's just starting from the scratch. Because one day I was not on Facebook. There was a time I wasn't on Instagram and I only joined TikTok yesterday. So <laughs> there's always a first time for something, right? Um, so if you're not on any social media platforms and you're like, how do I know who or I'm, I'm like I'm 16 I don't even know the first thing about who my audience is going to be this is one thing that I did when I was starting out you've probably sang in your church or you've probably sung for people you know wherever in, in a family gathering or in a pub or whatever and you probably had some particular songs that went down well with people so what you want to do is ask you know a, a pocket of individuals separately not not, not like on the, a public platform ask them privately to name or to describe you in like three words or to name certain artists that you remind them of, right? So you're starting from scratch. You don't know anything even about yourself as a creative or as a sound or as an artist or a brand. Get your, get people who've listened to you minister or sing before to say, two things you could say is one, you could either describe me in three words or who do I remind you of when I sing? And then you could work off the back of that. So if they come and say, oh, you remind me of who? I don't know, Erica Campbell, or if they come and say, you remind me of um, Kirk Franklin or something bizarre like that, you're like, oh, really? Now I know that if I'm similar to these artists, then if I produce a song, and, and if this is genuinely coming from multiple people, not like the random one, you know, if you're getting a common thread or a common sound or a common genre from the responses, mm -hmm. that would inform how you, as long as you're comfortable that that's who you are, because you don't want to be disingenuous to your own self, you know, that would inform how you then produce your sound, your music and um, your brand and how you market, because you could equally target fans of said sounds styles or individuals so i was kind of buttressing your point angela talking about just you know um identifying your target market or your audience but it was always nice to, to wrap it all with all those elements and hopefully that would help people that are um, um listening and watching as well so that was point number one by the way guys we are in point number one <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> fundamentals of music marketing, which is great because that's where it starts. You know, when I first started, I had a music consultant and I booked some sessions with him. And that was the first question he asked me, Angela. He was like, who is your music for? And I said, everybody. I had no idea. I was as green right. as they come. Oh, I was clueless. Yeah. <laughs> I was literally, I was like, <laughs> well, anyone who likes Christian music? And he was like, no, no, everyone is going to like you and you need to find your niche. That's so right. very spot on in terms of... Um, what people need to think about for their marketing strategy. So back to you for the next point. Then I think we'll just be going back and forth and, and fleshing it up. I kind of like this. <laughs> sure, sure. So the next, yeah. Well, I think, yeah. So once you define that your audience and like you said, look at the data and find out what your audience is already telling you about who they are, their age, their location, their gender, the type of songs they like. One thing that your um, Spotify for artists will tell you which, you, which you don't even have to have the app, just your regular Spotify profile will tell you which songs are the most popular and, ha <clears throat> excuse me, and have been downloaded the most. And that lets you know too, well, was my up-tempo song more popular? Are my slow songs more popular, right? And which, which songs are kind of resonating with my audience? And it lets you know how many monthly listeners are listening to you. So it lets you know, are they coming back each month? 
Are they revisiting your site? Right? Are they really fans? Mm. Are they following you? And it also lets you know once they play the song, do they save the music? Because if they save it, they're putting it in a playlist. They're listening to that song over and over. And so that really lets mm. you know this is this is something similar they'd like to hear in this style again. It also mm. forms type of new music you might put out. And so your audience will be will, is giving you information indirectly, right? And then you can directly ask them, like you said, who do I remind you of? Or tell me what you like about my music or ask them, how do you feel when you hear my music? Does my music encourage you? You know, what, mm. do, you, do you feel, um, you know, empowered in some way? And you could let them know what your goal is. You know, if your goal is to empower, if your goal is to encourage, do you feel encouraged by my music? It, you know, is, is it working? Mm. And get that interaction with your audience. So once you're clear who your audience is and kind of where they are, then you can target your marketing to them. You actually can do ads that go and find your audience. And mm -hmm. you can make what's called an avatar. And I think um, Cass will have more details on this. You can build an avatar for those artists that your audience says that you remind them of or that you self-identify with. So if I said, I feel like I'm a mixture of Yolanda Adams and Barbara Streisand and Celine Dion, say if you just mixed up all these different people and Kirk Franklin, just throw in <laughs> Kirk Franklin exactly. just for good measure. Then you go yeah, and yeah. find all the fans who like those artists and target your ads to those people and, and mm -hmm. introduce yourself to them. Because again, you're not for the whole world, you're for certain people who are mm -hmm. looking for you mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. like you and target your ads to them. And, it, and it's the same yeah. way with the gospel, right? We're not going to be able to reach everybody, but we're going to reach who, who we're called to reach with our personal style of ministry. Mm -hmm. So although we're called to the world, you know, we might be called to our corner of the world, to the people who relate to our message in the way that we bring it. And so we want to target mm -hmm. our message for the people who are waiting, who are waiting for us. And they just don't mm -hmm. know it because they haven't met us yet. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think talking about ads, there's a number of different ways that we can um, create ads. It's a bit of a conundrum, to be honest, because there's the front end. If you're on Facebook or um, Instagram, you can boost an ad from the front end, literally from the front of the um, of the app. But then there's the Facebook business manager, which is the back end where you can create a campaign, create an ad set and then create ads. And it's a very, it's almost like a science in itself and it's constantly changing and constantly being updated by Facebook. But that is definitely something that we can't, you know, unravel on today's session, but it's important if you're a creative and you want to do ads, it's important that you come up to speed with the, the development. It's always changing. So the most recent development on Facebook ads, um, which goes onto Instagram, you definitely need to come up to speed with all of that. You need to, if possible, go on a training. Um, you can start with YouTube videos. A lot of them are really useful and handy. Um, I tend to do Facebook ads, particularly for my Spotify. So you could do a Facebook ad, which directs or redirects people or repoints them to your Spotify. And you need to have a uh, what's called a Facebook pixel in your Facebook uh, business manager. So the pixel is a bit scientific now, but the pixel can track your um, people who actually land on your Spotify and click the link. So you can actually measure the performance of your Facebook ad against the cost and then you can ask yourself is it viable given of course that spotify only pays 0 0.006 pence per stream so you do want to you do want to make it make sense you don't want to pay a pound per stream by the time the person clicks the link but it does work because here's the thing about um facebook ads for spotify and spotify streams that ultimately in the long run if you if you're doing it consistently pays off with facebook ads uh, well to start with when you put music out on spotify you can go onto Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, every man and his dog, tell all your family and friends. And as Angela said, you get as many streams off the back of that. They may revisit and they may play back. They may save it. But then that is our little bubble, right? They may share it as well. You know, it might go viral. One out of a billion songs go viral without any effort. But most songs you need to put a conscious effort into promoting. So Facebook ads... The way that it works is once you've got your Facebook um, business manager account, when you create the campaign, create the ad sets and create the ad, it points people to your Spotify. They stream the music. 
they follow you potentially and they add it to playlists potentially depending on how you create the campaign. Now, what that does on the Spotify end of things is it triggers the algorithm. So the algorithm knows that something's happening here. People are listening to this person. And if you do it well, as I said, there's a science to Facebook ads and I can't even unpack all of that on here. I can, however, recommend some good courses because I've gone on a Facebook ad course. So if you want to know more about what courses you need to go on to, just DM me and I'll send you all the information. I have been sending it to people as well. Really useful. Um, different. Well, there's a number of different ones, but a particular one is really useful for when it comes to learning about Facebook ads. But anyway, that triggers the algorithm and the algorithm picks it up and knows that something is happening. And it then keeps on suggesting it, adding it to the bottom of playlists or adding it to people's queue, adding it to songs that sound like you because it's starting to pick you know, um, some activity is basically triggered and it adds it to its algorithmic playlists as well. So there's things like Release Radar and Radio. There are certain playlists that are not even editorial. They're just kind of generated by the algorithm. So the benefit of using Facebook ads for Spotify is that it gives something, it gives Spotify something to work with, with your music. And as ultimately, it opens you up to a whole new world of listeners. And the exciting part is, when you're on the brink of releasing a new song and you do these ads in that kind of window. So let's say I have a new song coming out, which I do anyway, I have a new album coming out in um, at the end of July. I'm now doing my Facebook ads because that is giving a lot of activity, kind of churning the wheels so that when the album comes out, there is already that activity happening. It's not like on the day the album is out is when I start running ads. You run ads and stuff that you probably already have. That's for somebody who's got music already. And that kind of, just churns the wheels and keeps things in motion. And then when the album comes out, the algorithm would just suggest your new album to those who've been watching and sorry, not watching, who've been listening off the back of the ads that you've created. So again, as I said, I think this whole thing of you telling the point and me kind of adding a bit of salt to, to give it more flavor is really cool. So she's just talked about ads, which is very crucial. And there are so many ways. I mean, Google ads is another one. I don't even think we're going to have the time to start talking about, um, but Let's even talk about Facebook ads because that goes to, uh, to Spotify. Very useful and very, very handy. And if you can, you know, get your get get yourself into some kind of training um, and get up to speed with how that works. But that's that on, on the ad side of things. The other thing I was going to talk about was the creative side of things, which essentially means, you know, social media, using social media to the best of your ability to grow your brand and to essentially raise awareness of your project. So, and that was where Cass actually comes into the picture because I know you talked about doing videos, doing comedy. I feel like artists are being pressured to become comedians just so that they can stay relevant on social media. I feel like in addition to just saying, hey, I have a song, you have to do stuff and be funny. And I'm naturally not a comedian. So I would struggle with that. So, for the creatives out there who feel like there's this pressure on them to be present on social media as part of their marketing campaign, I don't know if you've had any, you know, anyone talk to you about that concern and equally anything that you, any nuggets that you have for, for creatives who might be struggling in that space. Um, I mean, I haven't had anyone, well, to be fair, no, I have. There's a lot of people that don't like social media. Um, but I do personally think as someone that, I have a radio show, so when artists come and send their songs, the first thing I will do is go and check their social media because I want to see what you're doing. Um, mm. I want to be active. I want to see if you're on there. I want to see what, where are you, um, mm. Angela? But that's fine. Yeah, I think you have to. I think you have to be on social media. You don't have to do what everyone else mm. is doing on social media, and I think that's where the creativity comes in as an artist. Mm. You can, do so much things on social media that isn't comedy and that isn't funny mm. but it's still going to find the people that it's meant to find because people out there not everyone wants to be watching comedy all the time um mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. it's just up to the individual artist to create to think about what they can do that's comfortable for them that mm. just for the likes or for the views that isn't you know compromising their integrity mm -hmm. to get out there and one thing that i have had artists do with me before is um i've had their message me and say and i've i've done it a few times can you use one of my songs in the back of one of your videos um or can you make a video make a comedy sketch about my song and i did that mm. once 
And it just so happened, um, it was a guy in America, to be fair. He produced and he had artists and he said, can you use this video on the back of your song? So I did. And then there was a DJ from One Extra that heard it and he was like, what song is that? I sent it to him. And then he put it on a playlist on One Extra off the back of that video. Mm -hmm. So different things that you can do, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be even in the spotlight. It doesn't even have to be on your page. You can Absolutely. You, have, you just have to think about the creative ways that you can get your music out there in front of people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting you talk about when people send you their music, the first thing you do is check them on, on socials. And to be honest, most people check. It's like your online CV, right? Most people go and check your Instagram, particularly once they see any, or hear anything about an individual. And, and, and that's one of the, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but I'd like to get what you guys think about it. Because back in the day, if you didn't have a website, you were not considered serious. And people still say, have a website. I still advocate for having a website. But it's interesting that you'd say, you're going to their socials first. So how important is it for an artist to have a website? I think it is, but I'd like to get your your, your two pence on, on, on that. Well, I mean, I don't... I think it looks good off the back of it. Like, if I see an artist have a website, I'm like, okay, you, you'd set up and that. Yeah. And similar with social media, I'm like, okay, you are taking this quite seriously. Whereas if you send a song and you have nothing anywhere and I can't find it, it's about you... There's no about me. There's no other place for your music. There's just nothing. I'm going to be like, oh, the song might be amazing, but are you, is this something that you're doing long term? What is, I need to get like the scope of who you are um, yeah, yeah. to understand where you're coming from and to understand, are you taking it seriously yourself? Is this like something that you just want to do to do? So, yeah, I think for me, it's not vital that you have a website. I do more look for how active you are on social media. Are you, are you believing in your own work? Can I see that in your posts? Are you mm. pushing your off? Are you invested in you? Um, because that kind of makes me think, okay, yeah, this person, they really want this and, and their song is great. And, you know, I like it. But I mean, even if someone's song is great and they're not that active, because maybe they're not that confident, it wouldn't mean that I would write that off. But it's just the package, mm. I think, to be yeah. active on socials. Website, mm -hmm. I'm that post personally but other people maybe i guess when it comes to booking someone it behind mm -hmm. have a book rather than yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely Generally, i'm okay with that angela yeah. what do you think i'm the same as as cast if you have a website that's nice but if you don't have one you have to have socials because i think people now they want to enjoy your music but they want to know who you are they yeah. want to know how you are with your family. They want to know about the vacations you went on. They want to see you, you know, be, you know, behind stage. They want to see you writing music, practicing your craft and being a, a human being. It's like reality TV, but enhanced. Mm. A little bit. They want to feel like they can connect with you as a yep. person and not just every time they see you, you're perfect and you're on stage, right? And they want to know how mm -hmm. you look when you're not with your glam squad, right? All the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I find that you do kind of have to be not just an artist, but a social media per, uh, personality, I guess, or like this is a, it. Which, a YouTuber which, which, or something. Yeah, you know? which, which, I, which, I, which I find interesting because, as I said at the start, some creators, and I know it may sound a bit, you know, at, at odds with what I tend to be and, and do but I also like to be devil's advocate on these platforms is that some artists just want to get on with being the creative they don't want to be a YouTuber they don't want right. to be a social media guru have to. and you I have feel like to. exactly so it, I think the music industry has come to a place where you have to be almost a jack of all trades but a master of most <laughs> yes because <laughs> you may not yes. be able to master all you need to master your craft and you definitely need to master um a lot of so i see one of the creators on here is saying it can be hard and it's the yes. truth because if you're naturally not inclined then you have to create and a couple of tips that i can give and i'm sure Cass would probably even weigh in a bit more because she's more on the social media side of things is to schedule your social media mm -hmm. so as i mentioned earlier and i'm going to cheekily plug it in again i've got an album coming out and i was thinking to myself oh my goodness i have to have a plan for my social media so like a week ago I literally scheduled the next two weeks of what I will be posting 
to so so that at least I'm not overwhelmed. And I think that is the thing about you know being present and being deliberate about it is scheduling it as well, knowing what days you're not going to post. Not to say you have to post every single day, but knowing okay, Monday, Wednesday, whatever, I'm going to post about X, Y, and Z. And the thing about content creation that I found, and I'm not a content creator, but because we have to be present, as you say, Angela. I create content when I'm not even ready or when I'm not even thinking. So I could make a waffle, put some yogurt, put some strawberries, and I'm like, oh, this looks nice. And I just take a picture of it. And I may not paste it till three months, uh, post it rather, till three months after. But I've just created the content because I'm like, in that moment, I've seen something that is shareable. You know, um, I could be walking with my kids and we could just see a, a butterfly or whatever. And I just take it, take a picture create the content you know talking about family life and stuff like that pictures that you take in the park with your with your kids or whatever you may not want to show pictures of your kids but even the back of the heads you know whatever it is but it's very overwhelming if you're trying to create content in the moment I like to think of content creation as something you do over time and you're not overthinking it and you just kind of have a catalog of stuff even captions sometimes I also create a catalog of captions <laughs> because you, you, you could it saves you a lot of time because you could be like okay if i p post a picture of my face looking a certain way that's the caption i'm gonna use you know um but Cass, i want to really hear from you on this one because i've just seen some art some creators being like yeah this is hard and i do speak for them as well you know some tips from you on how to market creatively and you know smartly i could say on on when it comes to social media um i think when it comes to you see, I don't like the word content. I think it puts too much pressure on what you're posting. I think, okay. you know, for me, being someone that I started on social media just literally for fun, and then it became like a really serious thing. I was like, I need to upload every day, three times a day, morning, evening, and it became like a job. And then I started to really despise even creating any type of anything because I was just like, this is a chore now and I don't enjoy it. Um, and then I took a few months out and then I came back to it and I said, you know, mm. whatever you put out, the people that follow you are going to like it because they they like you. So you don't have to think about it that much because it's just mm. you being you on your page. You don't have to ask for nobody. You don't have to be a social media person. You don't have to be a YouTuber. If you want to post a picture of a plate, post a picture of a plate. Like it's your, it's your page. And it's, I think we put a lot of pressure on, yes, it's good to be on social media. Like I said, I think I always look for it, but you can be you on your page. And that's kind of it. Um, and as someone that is in the whole realm of, you know, needing to create content to get the views, primarily, mm. also because I like it, it's also <laughs> an element of finding yourself in mm. it. You don't have to be anyone else. You don't have to be that guy over there. That guy might be a comedian slash artist that's great for him. But if that isn't you, that isn't you. You can mm. just do who you And I think, yeah, for me, what has really helped in my content creation journey specifically um, is is not seeing it as content because that word was too big for me. I was like, all right, I just mm. want to post it. If I want to make a comment mm. sketch, post it. It doesn't have to be anything <laughs> massive. But I like the thing about planning as well because I think time-wise... Um, yeah, if you can take, like, I take out sometimes my Saturday mornings to create content, I said content, posts throughout the week. Um, and I'll say, okay, we know what you mean. I'm going to post this one. Yeah, but um, that just helps me to not really think about it that much. And I'll just make, like, five posts for the week. I'll have a time that I'm going to post them. And that's it. I just, you have to take the weight off of it. I think sometimes it's not, it's mm. not as heavy as what it feels. It just is you on your social media doing your life and the last thing i'm going to say as well is that generally in life i don't really like to share a lot of my life online if you go onto my page it is quite open because i do comedy but i don't share things about you know my dating life or i rarely post my in fact i never post my family on my actual page it's always in my stories um so even if you are quite interested and private because i know a lot of people have this thing about they don't want this is it yeah life out there, which makes sense but you don't have to it's up to you I choose what I post and then I choose what I don't want to post. If you just want to do music stuff, just do music stuff. If you don't want to put your life out there, you don't have to. Um, but I think people do value that a little bit more because it makes you a bit more human. But you don't mm. have to be who you think you have to be. Don't know if all mm -hmm. that makes sense. But oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And, and to your point, Angela, about, you know, people want to see you for who you are. I find sometimes I go onto certain people's social media and I think the question I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask is, do we ever get to a point where we graduate from being, um, how do I put it now? We graduate from there being the need for us to be there as, you know, people want to see who you are on a day to day. Because I go to some people's page and they've, they're established. So it seems like they've graduated from the need to post about everything that happens you know, from dawn, from dawn to dusk, and they have like nine posts. They've deleted everything. They, 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 oh, the entire journey from when they started, <laughs> and they have nine posts. And it's all picturesque, and it's all in neat corners, and each one is a specific highlight. And there's nothing about their personal life. And I feel like it. it do, do do people actually see that as a thing that you get to where? Oh well, there's no need for me to 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 put any pressure on myself. I can just post when I win my Grammy and post when I'm flying to <laughs> to wherever for a tour you know do we actually because I feel like it's almost a, a, an imbalance when the indie artist is hustling and posting a thousand posts and those who are established have reached that point where they've crossed the line and all they need to do is have nine posts you know aesthetically placed on their profile and that's that <laughs> you know it's true it's funny I think it depends on the artist you know you have some artists who say when you look at their profile, there's two million people who follow them and they follow zero. Yeah. And they have that. four posts. Because they're saying to you, You already know who I am and I don't even need this social media. I just do it because exactly. I have to have a page. But then you have some who are big like that and they still post a lot and they don't have to. Because True. they just like to relate, you know, to the audience. I like what Cass was saying. You can just be you and do you. You could share. I, I see people that share struggles too. It's not always the glamorous life. Those that just mm. had surgery, and here's me going through therapy. Here's me learning to walk again, or here's yeah. me learning some new instrument, and I'm really struggling right now. I'm not good, and I'm practicing. And you know, they're just showing you that they're a human being. And yes, putting it on a calendar. I know people who they do all their content at one time and then just kind of roll it out over the week, you know, and they're planning it. And so you can decide what, how much of yourself and what side of yourself you want mm. to show. And I, ha I actually actually had a friend who just told me, shameless plug, I have a project coming out. That's fine. <laughs> Come on now, let's do that. Summer. It's all marketing. It's all marketing. <laughs> yes. Let's go. And I have a song that's out now. It's called My Help. And I was talking to a friend of mine this week about how I just need to kind of push it. You know, it's doing well, but I just felt like I want to connect more. And he said, you know, you should do a my help moment and just talk about how God has helped you this week. Just mm. for one minute, just say, you know, today, let me tell you how, I got, how God helped me. And then say to your audience, how has he helped you? How, mm -hmm. you know, cause the song is my help comes from the Lord, you know? So how did the Lord help me today? And he, he was saying, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised how people would be encouraged just as much from that one minute little video as they are from hearing the song and in a way it is promoting the song but it's showing you and it's talking directly to your audience and you said about like captions you can have pictures of things and just tell your audience ask your audience to caption you could just say caption this and that's a way for them to speak back to you and that gets that engagement and that helps your algorithm too mm -hmm. because it shows your fans are talking to you and liking you could say if you like this put a heart if you like this put a fire you know whatever yeah, and yeah. just talk to your audience. They just want you to reach out to them because especially now with social media, when else could we listen? We listen to music of artists that we like or celebrities that we like, but how often can we talk to them and they actually respond mm -hmm. back, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what mm -hmm. the audience connects with. Like, wow, she actually liked my post and responded and, and replied to it, you know? And they can say, oh, you know, I've been there before. I've had surgery and, you know, I'll be praying for you or that that plate that you have that you cook that dinner looks really good, you know, or, or whatever. They can interact with you. And I think that's really what yeah. it's all about. And that's what makes them buy your music. Yeah, that's absolutely. When they, when they can you. connect with you. Yeah, right. absolutely. I, I can totally attest to that. And I just want to say to those watching on Facebook and YouTube, thanks for staying with us. If you have any questions on music marketing, I, I can already see you're engaging a lot. So thank you as well. Music marketing, um, promotion, any questions you have, drop them in there. And we're going to take them. So moving on to talking about the marketing strategy now. So we have kind of touched on the fundamentals, which is you need to know your audience. You need to be present on social media and things like that. But in terms 
terms of an overarching holistic strategy, some of the things that you need to have are, we talked about a website, you need to have um, a marketing plan and you need to know which different aspects you're going to be investing your marketing money in, whether it's going to be blogs, websites, radio campaigns, a tour, you know, um, uh, photo shoots which is essential because you need to have a good press image you want to have your press release distributed there's a number of different things that we need to kind of factor into a marketing strategy and a marketing plan and these things need to be built in for months before your release actually comes out and for months and months and months after so you have to have a plan that goes from well in advance of the release to after the release and i've seen some people who you know they work on the build up and then the release comes out and then nothing happens after that so i just wanted to get you know from your perspective angela especially because you work with independent artists helping them kind of formulate a robust marketing plan those things that you'd want to see in the in the plan from talking about bloggers how do you go about that to radio promotion tv maybe getting a video and as you talk, obviously, we'll be bouncing back and forth, but it'd be interesting to unpack that for people watching it so they can take some some valid points away as well. Well, I'll say with every plan, it starts with a budget, right? Because that budget determines how far you can go, how long you can go with your promotion and what Absolutely. different types of venues you can, you can do. And so a lot of times mm -hmm. artists, especially independent artists, they put all the focus on creating the music. They have this beautiful product beautiful album cover and they release it and they don't have the budget to push the marketing and promotion or they That's have right. just enough to go two or three months but music takes sometimes a year or two years to fully circulate especially with radio you have to have money for radio promotion and you have to have at least six months to a year of budget for radio promotion. Correct. And that's that's FM, terrestrial radio, AM radio, internet radio, right? That's Pandora. That's, Correct. you know, being able to keep it going on radio. If you're going to do ads, have a budget for that. And I always say, make your music or your ministry or your book, whatever your ministry is, <clears throat> make it part of your bills. So just like you have a, a cell phone bill or you may have a card note, just put your ministry right in your budget and have it as a monthly bill that you that you invest in every month, a certain amount to your marketing. And mm -hmm. one month it might be a blog or or getting a, a you know a PR firm to do some blog posts for you or to uh, update some of your marketing. Maybe get some new photos or you know maybe one month is buying more circle lights and cameras. You know, but keep investing in your marketing because it's going to be something that's a part of what you do ongoing you have people mm -hmm. who they invest in playing golf and they invest in yachting and for them it might be just a hobby but this is mm -hmm. not a hobby right so this is something you'll always be doing it's not mm -hmm. just a three month or six month you're going to be always making music so just put it in your budget you will always have some marketing budget set aside because you're mm -hmm. it will take a lot of money and it will take a oh, long yeah. time to continue marketing and promoting your music and the more oh, yeah. music you put out, as you put new music out, your old music starts to pick up streams every time you put a new song. So yeah. you'll want to be always just putting, reminding people about your channel, reminding them about your album, reminding, you're putting new things on your YouTube, learning TikTok, learning about reels, learning about, you know, different little things. You can use the same video on reels and TikTok and just recycle it in different it's places, everywhere. put it on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. And just find ways to stretch your budget, but just commit to the long term that this is something that's going to always be in your budget, just like your cell phone will always be in your budget. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think to that point, it's very, very, uh, some, some are just talking about investment being so important. And um, they say it has to be pretty much the biggest thing on your list when it comes to um, music create creation and marketing. And I was just going to say that actually, that when it comes to, having a marketing plan, um, I tend to advocate for at least, at the very minimum, if you're hypothetically spending a thousand pounds on a song, hypothetically now, guys, I didn't mm -hmm. say it costs a thousand, it could cost anything to produce a song, but if you're spending a thousand pounds on a song, hypothetically, have at least half of that for marketing so that you've got some money that can be either used, part of that could be used to create a, a lyric video, part of that could be used for Facebook ads, Part of that could be used for Google Ads. Part of that could be used to pay some PR companies to, you know, put your um, press release out and things like that. But you have to have a 
pound amount or a dollar amount set aside for marketing. It's one of the biggest mistakes we make is that we spend all this money creating this music and we don't even think that we need to put money aside to market it. It's very, very vital. If there's one thing you guys will take away from today, please, it's that you have to have marketing budget. Because what tends to happen is when you don't have that money and you hear about the cost of certain things, you're like, oh, my God, this is expensive. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. But if you at least had something earmarked for that, then when all of those different quotes come through, you can actually prioritize which ones you think are the most value for your money. And you can also do certain things for free. So I've, I've done I think I've done a quick fire nugget on um um, Instagram because Equilibrium actually started as a one minute video on my Instagram and I think I did one which is about marketing on a shoestring budget and I talked about how so because you have this marketing plan right you have a list of things that you need to spend money on and it's basically a prioritized list so you have radio ads or radio campaign potentially tv campaign YouTube you have to have a google ad campaign right because after you've whatsapped every man in your village you need to then reach out to the world. And unless you have a viral video, you need to have ads to back up your video. So you have to have um, something, a line for that, a line item for that as well. Then you have to have a line item for blogs and um, websites and um, pretty much interviews on those platforms. A line item for social media promotion and pretty much a music video if you're the actual cost of producing the music video as well. So you're not just producing it, but you're promoting it with Google Ads. All of those line items, you have to list them all out and then ask yourself, which one can I do myself for zero pennies? So start with that. If I can go and find all the bloggers in this world, if I dedicate one night, and I've done that before, I will go onto Instagram or Twitter and look for platforms that are bloggers I look for the email address and I create my database. It costs me zero pennies, right? Because I'm trying to save money on a radio campaign because I can't find a radio person. I don't know them. You have to look and weigh these things out. Okay, there's one thing I know I can't do, but the one that I can do, I will do it myself and I'll save that money and put it somewhere else. Because remember, we are independent artists. We don't have tens of thousands of pounds and we're accountable ultimately to God with our money. So it's like, unless you have all the money, by all means, pay people to do everything for you. I'm not even arguing with that in any way, shape or form. But if you don't have all the money, ask yourself, what can I do myself? COVID taught me how to make ly lyric videos myself. So if you go onto my YouTube and you hear the song, you see the song Victory with the bobbing heads, the memojis. I made that myself using the, um, the memoji thing in, in, the, in the iPhone, using Filmora wow. and using um, iMovie. And I got all the guys who featured on the songs to tell me what they wanted their avatars to look like. And I did all of that with the help of, of my kids, you know, and and it cost me zero pennies. But then I could use the money that I would have used to make the video to pr promote it on Google Ads. So this is where your marketing sort of your marketing mix comes into play. What are the different aspects of my marketing budget and my marketing plan? And what the important question is, what can I do myself for zero pennies? And then what are the very important things I need to do? And then you kind of read and on my budget, right? If you see my spreadsheet, I have some things where I go redirect to X because it's like money saved here, redirect to that, <laughs> literally. That's right. That's right. That okay, I've saved some pennies here, redirect to this. Sometimes I do like, okay, I can't do this, but I'll go on to five. I'll get someone to do it for me for 30 quid. But my budget was 80 quid. I've saved 50 pounds, redirect to Y. Literally, I always redirect everything to radio, to be fair. Everything yes. is. Redirected. Yes, that's the most expensive. Everything. It's the most expensive. So everything gets redirected to radio because it's the most expensive, especially for US radio. It's the most expensive. Yes. And then your promotions on Google and Facebook are the next most expensive. But everything else, think about what you can do yourself because it would save you a lot if you can, you know. I'm just thinking as you're describing your budget, um, as a rule of thumb, whatever it costs to produce the music, I set aside 10 times that amount for promotion. So oh, look here. I was even putting so, aside half. <laughs> yeah. I mean, up to, up to, because I want to at least have there a year's you worth, you know? So if the sales go. song costs 1500 to 2000 US dollars, then I know over a year or two, I need to be putting to 20000 to really push it, right? And that's so that I can earn it back in streams and 
radio play and concert bookings or whatever, right? And so it might take a year to two that I spend that, but that's the amount that it really takes to push it, right? Mm. And if you don't have that full amount, you decide, like you said, what could you do for free? That would have cost, but it didn't, but it would cost me, you know, that much. And what who could you get to volunteer? You had your kids to help. You may have friends that can help. You might find college uh, interns, students. I live in a college town, and so I have university, you know, music students and film school students who need credit. So they'll help make videos uh, for exactly. credit. And so you just, that's another redirect. So I'll start doing that, <laughs> redirect that, that money <laughs> where I had an intern. Another way you could do it too is if you are the creator of the song and you are the writer of the song, you might be able to give points or publishing to people for work helping you with your promotion. So maybe they didn't mm. write the song, but they're going to push and they have the contacts and they're going to go and contact all the radio stations for you and schedule interviews. Maybe you give them 1%, 2% of your publishing because they're helping to push the song and you could do that mm. as well. So you're paying, but not directly. Right. Right. And they're invested into the song and they want to see it be pushed so that they can get money mm. on the back end. So there's lots mm -hmm. of ways to thank people for helping you and without having to cost that 10 times number, but just know that it, it, it probably will cost it 10 could. times if you were just to pay it outright. Absolutely. And it really does, which is where having a budget where you've got it phased over a period of months mm -hmm. and, you know, that's, that's the beauty of having a budget as opposed to just knowing, oh, I have X but then you don't know exactly how you're going to be spending it because you need to manage your cash flow as well. So as you said right. earlier, I think you mentioned spending a specific amount on radio, know how much you're spending monthly on radio so you can manage your cash flow as well. Just like your bills, right. as you said, itemizing your bills. So, and the thing about having it this way is that you know which month you're going to be spending so much that you have to yes. chill and just yes. take a breath because you don't want to put so much burden on yourself as well. I mean, at the right. end of the day, it's coming out of our pocket. So, you know, okay, this month, if I spend X on radio and I put a video out on this in the same month and I'm spending on Google ads, maybe the following month, I'll only focus on X and then post on the other one. And, and it's just, it's, it's an entire geeky kind of thing to do, but it's needed because unless you have somebody looking after the marketing side of things for you, you're going to have to do it yourself. And the thing about being independent is nine times out of 10, you're your best marketer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I, right. I, I don't know if there are organizations that could do marketing I haven't really looked into it. I'm sure there are, but I would much rather market myself myself to the point where I'm comfortable and I can then know what to expect from somebody else who was marketing my stuff. I don't know what you think, Angela. Yes. And I like that you said you took the time to get all those um, bloggers and made that database because that, because now you have the list. So the next time you do it, you already have the list. You don't have to do it mm -hmm. from scratch, right? And so that saves you mm -hmm. time on the next round. So when I put out my first song, You Deserve, I was calling stations myself, introducing myself. And then when I did my second single, My Help, I'm calling them back. They're like, yes, I remember you. I've made that relationship so that it's a little bit easier to call and say, I have a new song coming out. Thank you so much for playing the first song. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for the e-blast you did last year. I have something new. They're like, yeah, Sarah, I remember you. You've made those relationships and it's that much easier the next time you have to do it. And so you mm -hmm, find mm -hmm. it that it, it just gets easier. People start to look for you and they, they, they're more open when they see your product come across their email. They say, oh, mm -hmm. what, what's this new thing that Sarah has? Let's hear it, you know, because they've, mm -hmm. they've heard from you and they've heard your voice, they've interviewed you. And like you said, you're the best person to market yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know you know how you want to be presented exactly and, and in terms of branding because that was something I wanted us to talk about where we kind of we kind of jumped ahead and talked about the more hot topics but I think just taking a step back to branding because ultimately we're marketing a product or marketing a sound how important would you say branding is to the entire you know package if you like of, of marketing it's so important for an artist. You know in gospel music, it's so different because we don't think about branding in the terms of like commercials or like endorsements the way maybe like a pop artist would. You know, we could see a mm. rapper or a pop star on a, say, a Sprite commercial, you know, or a Skittles commercial or something, you know, like that or, or automobile commercial. But we don't really see gospel artists that way with branding in that way. But they're starting to see 
alignments now with major uh, restaurants like McDonald's or uh, we see like CC Wine is on the Crest commercial because she has a beautiful smile on toothpaste commercials. You know, you're starting oh, wow. to see gospel artists, you know, crossing over to mainstream audiences through products. But it's because they have a brand that's not just gospel, but it's saying mm -hmm. it's wholesome. It's happy. You know, it's inspirational. Right. It's encouraging. And so the more you can mm. relate across markets and, and be commercial and see yourself as, you know, what do I represent? How do I make people feel? And could they see me hosting, you know, a, a, a fundraising gala? Could they see me, um, you know, sponsoring cupcakes? Could they see me selling something other than my music? Can I sell mm. toothpaste? You know, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm, it is, mm -hmm, can I go? Mm -hmm. A, a cereal or a coffee, you know, can they see me in their everyday life? And that's what yeah. social media helps because they see you in the grocery store. They see you cooking. They see you mm -hmm. living life. So you're not just a gospel singer. A they don't singer. just see you on stage in church. They see you mm -hmm. in life. And the more you're just in life, now you're building a brand that's more commercial that can sell mm. more than just your music. And so you'll mm -hmm. want to be careful with who you align yourself with because that's your brand. Um, just kind of how you dress is part of your mm. brand, how you present mm -hmm. yourself, even the types of things you post on your social media, the type of TikTok videos you put out, the type of, yeah. you know, reels that you do. It's, it's good to have fun. And, you know, but then sometimes you're like, is that on brand? If I do that, if it. I do that dance competition, you know, on TikTok, it's fun. It might be okay for my, my kids to do it. But if I do it, would that damage my brand at all? You know, so mm. we we'll have to be careful sometimes that even though you're having fun and it's social media, it's still your brand and it has to be mm -hmm. on brand for what you represent. Are you saying to the world that you're a mother and you love your children? You know, what does that say about your brand? Uh, that you are funny and you're a comedian like Cass. Well, I think she might, can, I might want Cass to host an event because she speaks so well and she's so engaging and so funny. That's her brand, right? And so you wouldn't want to see her out in the street, like, you know, slashing someone's tires because she was mad at someone and hosting on Instagram somebody, you know, right? Oh, so yeah, that whole brand, drama queens. Yeah, right? exactly. Though, like, I don't want to deal with that. She might be a little crazy, right? So we have to manage <laughs> our brand. And all we have to know everywhere we go, we are a brand ambassador of our, of our product, which is us. Yeah, yeah. And what we yeah. represent. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wonder if, if Cass yeah. wanted to add to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it is you so right. It is everything that you do is part of your brand. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier about what you post and what you don't post. And I think I think a lot of times we might get really caught up in what our brand is. But one thing that you can do is um ask people to uh if you go onto your stories and you say, Okay, describe me in three words. And sometimes people come back to you and say, well, I think you're this and I think you're that. And you don't even know that that's how people are perceiving you. Mm, that's good. That, and you can run with it because you're like, that's what I wanted my brand to be. But if you don't like it, then that's how you know how you can kind of tweak it. Um, mm. Because sometimes you're not really aware of what your brand is. And I've had conversations. Yeah, you're right. Like, I don't know what, my, what is my brand? What is that? But if you ask people, what do you see me as? And then you can kind of have a basis to work off of. And like you said, Angela, it's just about keep into that and you can change up a bit it's not to say like mm -hmm. as soon as you establish your brand you can't evolve it's a bit like Billie Eilish whose brand was baggy clothes don't wear nothing that's who I am but then recently she came out and did a cover and she was in lingerie and everyone was like oh, that's not her brand but she changed right. it she changed her brand so right. it's not to pigeonhole yourself but it is to say mm -hmm. if something doesn't align with who you are as a Christian it's not it if who you are <laughs> it's not it authentic <clears throat> I think people really value that just being authentic, finding out who you are authentically and then putting that out mm. there in a way that people can relate to it. Um, but yeah, you have to watch what you do as well. Like you said, absolutely. I've never got nothing crazy on my thing, slashing tires, because people would be like, <laughs> <"I want her." laughs> You'd be surprised <laughs> what you see. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, <laughs> you have to just kind of watch what you post and make sure it's just what feels good to you. If you look yeah. at it, and if that, like you said, if that dance challenge doesn't feel good to you, don't do it. It's not right, part yeah. of your brand. 
don't do it. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> because people are going to pick up on it as well. People will fully pick up on if something isn't comfortable to you. Oh, yeah. Your brand, but you just do oh, it yeah. like everyone else's. So it's important to really have that solid, who am I and what is yeah. my brand? Let me work mm-hmm. out. Then you work around that, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it might take time yeah. as well. It might take time for you to establish or to identify who you are and what your brand is. Um, you may need to pray about it. You may need to, as you say, ask people what they think you are. You may need to go internally and internalize the question and ask yourself, who do you think you are? What What are you comfortable with in terms of how you're perceived as well? Do you, If people perceive in a certain way, are you comfortable with being perceived that way? You know, do you want to even change that perception that people have of you? Um, are you a naturally funny person? I know that I'm funny amongst my friends but I struggle to be funny like on social media. And I, I don't see myself being a social media comedian. But when I'm with friends and family, we're all like, you know, in stitches. I say stuff and everyone's laughing. But that, yeah, that just doesn't make me a social media comedian. Um, so it's about knowing who you are and what you're comfortable with and um, sticking to that for a season. You know, you may rebrand yourself over time. It's important to actually rebrand. I always use Coca-Cola as a good example. Coca-Cola has been in, has been around for over 100 years, if I'm not mistaken. But they've rebranded more, more times than I can count. And they don't need to because everyone knows Coca-Cola, right? There's no reason for them to rebrand. But they stay relevant because they're constantly rebranding. And so, so much more do we need to think about that given that we're not even as popular or prominent as those brands so we need to think about your brand establish your brand stick to the brand for a season and when the time is right to just just rebrand and I think when it comes to branding as well it feeds into the sound that you produce so artists look a certain way because of the genre that they're in Mm -hmm. so whilst you're looking at your brand you need to be you know you need to make sure it is in line with your sound right so if you're coming out with oh my brand is that I'm gonna have green hair but then I'm a worship leader you might want to ask yourself if that really (laughs) if if it really ties together having green hair and being a worship leader not to say you can't but what how is that going to be perceived right so those right. are the things again, that we need to ask what, ourselves based on your, again based on your audience will that green hair turn off that audience yeah. or will you just exactly. a new audience of green hair people who need to be experience green hair people i love that <laughs> you find a new audience <laughs> audience of green hair people yes. <laughs> an audience of kermit's green people yes. <laughs> But no, definitely. And it's all about asking those questions. And it doesn't come overnight. I think that's the point I'm trying to make is you need to give yourself time to process this, to analyze this, to come with your results. Right. I remember when I started out, I just wanted to be to be not so much. I know my sound's different anyway, but I also wanted to be visually different. And so I had for a season, I was always wearing an updo, whether it was my natural hair, whether it was braids, whatever it was, I always had an updo on. And interestingly enough, sometimes when I went for gigs, people after I've been off stage and I, I'm maybe backstage or whatever, oh, I remember you, you're the lady with the hair. You know, it's like, at least if you stood in a crowd, you could be, you know, you could stand out from, from the crowd because of that. Some people go with specific colors all the time and that works for them. They only wear a certain color, some always wear a bow tie, you know, some just have a specific thing. Just trying to help you guys when you're thinking about branding. It could even be about what you wear. Like Muiwa in the UK always has an Ankara scarf around his neck and no one else. I mean, you see him and you just know that that is Muiwa because he's got an Ankara scarf around his neck. Some people's brand is a catchphrase. Um, Governor B's is Allo Mate. So regardless of what happens, once you hear Allo Mate, you know it's Governor B. And for different artists, it's different things. For some artists, it's a sound they make in a song that when you hear that sound, you know who it is without even seeing them. So the branding could be anything from not just oh, how am I perceived on social media, but what makes you stand out from the crowd? What makes you distinctive amongst a multitude of people? And that comes from really knowing yourself, you know, getting people to obviously give you some thoughts and feedback, praying about it as well, because we're in ministry as much as we're, you know, talking business, praying about it and being authentic. And then obviously reevaluating that over time and rebranding as and when, you know, we need to rebrand. But that kind of plays into the final question I have, because there's so much to unpack on music marketing, you know, tips and, and tricks. And hopefully you guys who are watching, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the feedback anyway, that it's, you know, it's, it's benefiting you. So I don't even need to ask. Um, but thanks for engaging. So 
the part I wanted to talk about, which kind of feeds off of branding and getting the product out and obviously looking at your marketing plan is post-release, right? So you talked about how CC Wineland is in an ad and all of that. That's all part of their post-release because now that the album is out, all these things are happening and it's because she's got a certain brand, she's got a certain image, her song is up, but then it's being galvanized with other activity that's happening and raising her profile and people are going to check out who some may not be Christians and they see her, who's this person? They check it out and they find out about her music. So the question is maybe to Angela and then to, to Cassandra post release, what are the critical things that um, artists need to do? Cause one big mistake that I've seen, and I still saw it yesterday. I've seen artists make is countdown on Instagram, five days to go, four days to go, three days to go. The album drops tomorrow the album drops and then then we don't hear anything from them until the next until six months after when there's another release so the post release seems like there's a lot of attention paid to the pre-release on the day they might come and do a live but then the post release which you've already very cleverly mentioned angela could go on for 12 months that is what i want us to kind of unpack in the next maybe 10 minutes and i know there's so much to be said but that is a key area that sometimes gets overlooked completely, but that's the most important thing that can establish the longevity of a project um, in the minds of people who listen and, and see it. Yes, and so just like we talked about that content calendar for social media, you could make a post-release calendar and you could say, okay, how? what are all the different ways I'm going to keep this project in front of my audience over the next six months to a year? So you have radio, and if you're doing radio, every time you chart or make or get added to a station, you will thank that station on social media for playing your song. Oh, click here to download, right? So you'll be doing that for six months, right? And that's letting everyone know it's on the radio. Listen to it. Call in. Make requests. And you're thanking the station. So you're tagging those stations and it's showing them love. They're retagging you. You're getting interviews and just be scheduling interviews for the next you know, three months, six months, then you're going to be doing a video maybe. So you'll roll out the video. Then you have your lyric video, roll out the lyric video. You could have groups, you could have um, maybe there's praise dancers who are dancing on your song or like cast asking people to put your music in the background of, of a social media person and just constantly seeing how your song is getting all through the culture. It's everywhere. Mm. It feels mm. like it's everywhere, right? Making connections with people in other countries to say, oh, I heard someone playing the song in Nigeria. I heard the song in the UK. I heard the song in Brazil. It's all over the world. It feels like everyone is listening to the song, right? Maybe you write a book. Maybe you have some devotional tied to the, to the song that comes out, you know, three months later, six months later, some journal type mm. book reflecting on the song. And then maybe you do a concert. So you have to be thinking of content and events around that song post-release for a good year. Yep. And that's yep. part Absolutely. of that. Don't let the song die. Like, don't let it just be out there and just go to song graveyard, you know, once it's out there. <laughs> song graveyard. <laughs> I like that. To do things, you know, and, and, and show yourself in the studio. Sometimes people will do, like, countdown. They'll show, like, themselves preparing the song like recording it and part of the post release could be behind the scenes of you in the studio making that song and um showing them you writing new music and working like six months later you're working showing them that you're working on the next song that's coming out mm -hmm. some months later you know just mm -hmm. keeping you know the process of that song in everyone's mind that it's still alive it's still circulating and every time it's moving more and more up the charts, just being careful to thank your fans. My first song, You Deserve, I released in 2019, and we pushed it for about a year. Wow. Right at the middle of the pandemic, it reached number seven on the Billboard chart for gospel. Wow, indicators. that's amazing. And it took, thank you. It was like, God, it's so good. This is the middle of a pandemic. And people, you know, it still was charting. We couldn't travel. We couldn't really go out and promote it. But I was out there like, thank you. You know, on, on live, I did a whole live just thanking the fans when the plaque came from Billboard. I was like, we have to go live and thank everyone. That song came out two years ago. 
And I have a new song now, but I'm talking about something that came out two years ago that we're just coming to celebrate, right? Yeah. And so it's keeping it alive in the minds of the fans that helped to push it two years ago so they won't forget. It's still there. It's still charting. And just reminding people that they were a part of that process. You know, mm, so people mm, want mm, to see mm. what, what are you doing post-production. So when the new song comes, they can download that. And then you say... Oh, yes. And now my album is coming at the end of the summer. So look out for that. And they can be mm. looking for the next release. So keeping your fans engaged, thanking them, letting them be a part of the process, even post-release, keeps the song alive. Because you have to have the stamina to keep that song going for a whole okay. year. Yeah. Find new, Absolutely. fresh ways to make it seem like it's exciting, mm. even though, okay, we heard the song, we downloaded it, now what, right? How to make you keep <laughs> listening to it over and over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I think that's where the creative side of things comes into play because you have to think outside of the box it has to be yes you have to just think of new th new ways to do the same thing effectively because the same right. thing is you're trying to promote the song to people but you have right. to think of creative you know ways to go about that and probably Cass it would be interesting to get some tips from you given that you're more of the creative one in terms of you do videos you do comedy I mean if you had to give people some tips on creative ways to keep their songs fresh in the minds of people what kind of ideas would you would you give I would always say make videos. I think I'm a video person um, and I watch videos all the time. I obviously make videos, but I think there's just so much potential in your song just staying alive if you put it mm. on a video. Um, mm. When you just do something with it, do something creative. Like I said, I've had literally people reach out to me and say, can you just put this in the back of a video that you make? Like you don't even have to reference it. Just if you can put it in the caption, which I always will because why wouldn't I do that? But it's just, it's just putting it out there on your platforms, mm. on platforms that are doing quite well. So we mentioned TikTok earlier. TikTok is a really great place just to make songs go places. You can make a video and put your song in the background and then that's it. People will pick it up and reuse it and it's free. You don't have to pay anyone to do that. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I would definitely say utilize that and similar to what Angela said as well. Yeah, just making sure it stays alive. Making sure if you are contacting, because I do radio and sometimes people will contact me um, and I don't immediately see it. And some people might give up, but don't give up because sometimes people just don't see your email. <laughs> like, mm, okay. And don't tire out with that. Um, just be consistent with it and just making sure that you you just keep it. Yeah. Video wise, 100 percent reels, find things to do. Mm. Yeah, that's what I you know. I, I, jo I joined TikTok yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> you have and to I feel so silly because I'm not the person who would stand in front of a camera and video myself for no reason, right? So I need I need tips from you, Cass. On <laughs> oh, yeah. I know a, I know a guy. He's a DJ, and he is not. He doesn't like being on camera whatsoever. He can't stand it. Um, but he he knew he had to join TikTok, and oh, so Nick. what he did was he. Um, did a TikTok and he just did like a mix. He wasn't really in the, in the camera. He, he just had his DJ set here. And then it was like the side of him. And he had a mix that he played for like a minute with like, you know, five different songs. And that was it. And it did really well. And people were really just catching on. So if you was an artist that you don't like being in the camera, you have five really good songs that you want people to hear. You don't even have to be on the camera. You could make a little mix, you know, use that sound, do a video to it. It could be a lyric video. It could just be you at the site. It could be anything. It's just the sound. Yeah, yeah. It could be my pots and pans. It could be like pots and pans. It could be anything. Like people, people. Uh, but it works for him and he is now doing quite well off the back of that because he didn't want to be on the camera but he knew that he had really good mixes and he said, I can really, I can mix things and I have a way of doing that. So, yeah, if you aren't the type of person to be on the camera, there are ways to to put your music out there without you necessarily having to be at the forefront of it. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. I know, definitely. You you've given me some ideas. So I'll, I'll think about. You have to do it, things. Sarah. Come on over to TikTok. Come on over. <laughs> are you on TikTok, Angela? I am. I only have two little videos, and my videos are me um, in the studio, just little twenty five second, one minute clip of working on a song. And so I'm there, I'm on the video, but I'm not like right there in your face, but you see me and I'm singing and it's not, it's not glamorous, you know, it's there. Yeah. 
you feel like you're in my session, but you're not really, you know, you're there. Not, yeah. It's just enough of a clip. And it just says, one of them says, this is my first TikTok, you know. Yeah, <laughs> me too, to be honest. Behind the <laughs> scene. That's it. You know, people like you it know, and they watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually have two videos, but one of them was like, okay, so I created the account yesterday and I'm like, well, I have to put something now. So I just put <laughs> one of the um, clips of me leading worship because I wanted oh, to good. establish it from the very get go that I'm not a comedian. <laughs> Right, and that's that's so going to be your brand. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. So I'm like, well, let me put the first video as a video of me singing worship, and then, and I'm like, okay, uh, three people watch it, two people watched it, because I was the third person who watched it. <laughs> <laughs> so, because on TikTok, you get um, it shows all your likes accumulate, so you can see at right. the top all your total likes. So I have like three likes, one of which is mine. Um, and then today I said, okay, let me post another video. So I did one of me saying it's me Sarah Tabor it was like four seconds long and the caption was nobody you know there's nobody memes and then me announcing myself on TikTok so it was like making fun of myself and now I'm exhausted I'm thinking... <laughs> you'll be surprised that one might have even more views than the first one <laughs> you know I know right let's see I don't know you know I'm not even the only reason I'm on there is because I feel like you have to be there because it's the next platform oh my goodness yeah i don't know it's and then you open it and everything just goes loud anyway so <laughs> i'll let you know how many views i have but i feel like it's the next thing you know that people need to be on as creatives and i think that's part of evolving and responding to the times is you can't be too old for new technology otherwise you mm -hmm. become obsolete and even though there might be people you can delegate you know creating and managing your social media to you want to connect with the fans ultimately so yeah, it should be fun. TikTok should be fun. But anyway, um, guys watching on YouTube and YouTube and Facebook, thanks for hanging out. And if you have any final questions, please let us have them now because we're going to be wrapping up. I just wanted to get some final words from Cass and Angela. And thank you so much, ladies, for hanging with us. Unfortunately, we didn't have Derek. I suspect he might have been held up, but he did message me that he was going to be joining at 9.30. So I guess maybe he was um, caught up in other things. But thank you so much, Cass and Angela, for hanging with us and for the wonderful nuggets of insight. I mean, everyone on the in the comments section they've been talking about how this is really useful insightful and i'm sure they're going to be taking these tips and applying them to their own creative journeys so just final words from you both um to people watching if there's anything that you'd want them to take away as a critical you know um learning from today's session just fire away um i would say um know your know who know your audience right know who you're called to uh know who you are and while you're discovering your brand, you may not know fully what you are, but start to identify what you're not. Mm. You know, so I know that I'm not this, I'm not that, I don't do that. But that will help you to decide maybe who you are, who you could be. And be mm. open to growing, be open to rebranding, even as you mm. discover your brand, be open to continuing to grow in that branding. And commit mm. to supporting your your promotion and marketing long term, so that this your music it. doesn't go to the music graveyard. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the key word there is long term, and we probably should have mentioned that at the start because sometimes we go into this thing and we think, "Oh, I'll just put a single out," and we don't have long term plans. So, if there's anything you're going to take away from what Angela said, equally, pay attention to the words long term. Think about this as something you're in for the long haul and not just for six months. And and off the back of that, let your marketing plan reflect that. That's really, really, really um, insightful, Angela. And Cass? I think I would just say, in terms of content, uh, don't overthink it. Um, mm. Just be you and your people will find you. That's mm. there's someone for everyone out there. You may think that you have nothing really great about your personality or, you know, you're a bit boring, but there are going to be a whole load of boring people that will look and think, oh, that's mine. I like them and I like them. Yeah. I and with like green hair. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to do you and don't get so caught up on, don't lose the love for it. I think sometimes when you do get caught up on all of these things of the marketing and the content and I need to post and I need to this and that, you can sometimes lose the love for what you're actually doing. Um, but yeah, just keep loving it. Do you find you and 
yeah, man, enjoy the process. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cass. And we had one last question, one last late entry uh, of a question, but I think it's good to, to address this. What's your primary platform? And I suspect David Williams is talking about social media because the truth is one of the reasons I didn't join TikTok is because I, I just had too many. I had Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and I'm like, oh, not another one. So that's a very valid question. You know, what's the primary? Because you should have a primary platform. So probably to both of you, what's your primary, uh, your primary? And what would you advise people to have as their primary platform as well? My primary platform has turned into Instagram lately. It was Facebook before. And now I find that Instagram is just quicker. And I, I can, I don't know, I feel like I can see the engagement easier. Um, I do still have my Facebook page, but I have to go do a story on Facebook, then post on Facebook, then go to Instagram and post there, then do a story. It just becomes like Cass says, like too much work. So I try to stick with Instagram because I can put a picture of something and a quick something text and get quicker, you know, likes and engagement. But I do have a TikTok. I have to get more content out there. But for right now, Instagram is my primary platform. And do you think that's going to evolve over time to TikTok the same way we've gone from Facebook to Instagram? No, I don't. It, it could. I don't know what features TikTok will add right now. Um, I don't know enough about TikTok and whether you can comment on there or is it just to like but I do like on Instagram that you can DM and you can comment and I think that oh, can you that not do that on, on on I haven't even I explored know. TikTok that I, much to know yeah, what either. you can and I know can't you can do. like but I don't know about comments and DMs so ah. it, it could it could become the next thing I don't know but I but okay. Instagram now has reels, so that's you can put your TikTok video on reels. So I think that if you can find a way to do them together, that may help. Yeah, that's what I've done. I've put my TikTok videos, my my two second TikTok videos onto reels, and I think my reels go onto my Facebook. So it's kind of all synced mm -hmm. in a way. So that kind of saves you the effort. Um, Cass, okay. uh, my primary platform at the moment is Instagram because I built all my following on there. At the moment, I've got like twenty six thousand people on there. So that's just where I went in at. When I started, that was the more popping thing. Um, mm. But I still for so I still think Instagram has a substance to be as much as TikTok is the new thing now. There's still mm. a substance with Instagram that you don't really get with TikTok. You can still have a you can still have a more of a brand on Instagram, whereas TikTok it isn't. I never. Yeah, got to you're right. Be like a brand, you don't get to post pictures. It's not as aesthetically pleasing. Um, it's great for content and I would always say be on everything in my head you just you shouldn't ever pigeonhole yourself because if one of them goes down you're going to need to be on the other ones because oh yeah you know. but my primary platform is Instagram at the moment it's evolving into TikTok but I will always keep my Instagram just because mm. I think it has I don't know just more of a weight to it there's more of a there's more of a substance to it there's more you know scope to be a little bit more deep and have a longer caption and people can get to know you a little bit more because you can post a little bit more and yeah so for me yeah that's, that's right so so in tiktok you can't have a caption that people can actually read right i've not really explored it that well but it's, it's limited so it's a very short one they don't let you like write and write and write they don't want people to read this is why i didn't want to join tiktok in the first place because i'm like <laughs> you don't want our kids to read just watch three have a really really low attention span of three second videos or whatever three minute videos you don't read anything you only watch videos it's like i was actually rebelling against tiktok for a long time like i'm not doing this i'm not supporting this at all and then that what do you know yesterday i joined so there um, <laughs> Before we know it, you'll be doing dance contests. Oh my God, please no. <laughs> but you know the funny thing is, the funny thing is, on my new album, another cheeky plug, which is out on the 30th of July, and there's an Afrobeat song. And on my previous album, I had Bless, which was the Afrobeat song, which has the most streams and all my other songs combined. So I knew, and I always wanted to do this anyway, but I knew even more that I have to have an Afrobeat song on all my projects because that's what everyone loves. Um, and so one of the things that we're planning to do is like a, a dance challenge on TikTok. But then what that's going to mean is that they might be looking for me to do a dance as well. <laughs> so, I'll have to that. do it. I will Pardon? I'm going to be looking for that. 
Oh me no, too. not you, Cass. Me too. <laughs> not you. Now that you said it, I have to say it. Like, do you know? I, I'll, yeah. I'll just do it. You know, you know, there's the easy ones. They do on TikTok. Well, you just. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that with me. I'll be done in five seconds. That's easy, easy, easy as pie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is this was really really cool. Thank you so much for your time, ladies. I'm gonna let you go because I've kept you for an hour and a half, and I know you need your beauty, sleep, and whatever else that keeps you going. Um, but thanks as well, guys, on Facebook and YouTube for enjoying the session because I can see from the comments, and I'm hoping that there's a lot of things that you can take away from today's session. Um, next week we're having equilibrium live again same time thursday 9 p.m if you haven't subscribed please hit the bell or whatever it is that you need to hit on youtube subscribe so that you know when we go live next week 9 p.m we're going to be talking about artist management that's another aspect of the uh, music business space that sometimes we don't really understand the dynamics of you know compared to a booking manager compared to self-management what do you need to know about the artist management relationship when should you get a man uh, when should you get a manager and um and when shouldn't you get a manager so we're going to be talking about all of that next week thursday so please join us tell a friend to tell a friend and let's get knowledgeable together all right guys until next time please stay safe Stay well and God bless you all. Bye. Bye-bye.